How do you reckon Gustav Mahler conducted his own music? Well, here are a few words from a member of the New York Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra, an orchestra that Mahler conducted, and this guy played under Mahler, and he talks about, very briefly, about how Mahler opened his fourth symphony. His fourth symphony, his theme is da 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 My God, he asked all of us violins to do da 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 Interesting. La di da, li da da. Now, here's a conductor who actually did play that music in that way. Now, that was the great Dutch conductor, Willem Mengelberg, who was a friend of Mahler, a great interpreter of Mahler. Uh, he organised a Mahler festival in 1920 where all the symphonies were played. Uh, he repeatedly performed them outside of that context, including the Fifth Symphony, the First Symphony, the Fourth, as you can hear, the Ninth, the Eighth. And um, I would say that that recording of the Fourth, which you can get complete, is probably the most authentic interpretation of a Mahler symphony on disc. He also did the fastest version of the Adagietto, the first recording of it in fact, about seven minutes, which uh, when you consider that Bernstein and Hermann Schechen took about 15 minutes is uh, pretty unusual, but it is supposed to be a love song, so I reckon it works pretty well. Well, what is special about Mengelberg as a conductor? Well, first of all, he trained his orchestra absolutely mercilessly. He used to take ages rehearsing them, he used to talk and talk and talk, he'd drive some people mad, but he always gave his players a very vivid idea of exactly what he wanted them uh, to do. In fact, I mean, when I was in New York some years ago, I had a look at uh, one of his scores. They were marked up in different coloured pencils and every bar, it's unbelievable. He took absolutely uh, tremendous pains to get things right and to get across the message through the music that he wanted to. Uh, sometimes it meant, uh, let's say, tweaking things or bending the line or altering tempi or making cuts. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But um, what I'd like to do next is just play you a short extract from his recording of the Romeo and Juliet Fantasy Overture by Tchaikovsky. He was a great Tchaikovsky conductor. He knew the composer's brother, Modeste. He repeatedly programmed Tchaikovsky's music. He made wonderful recordings of the last three symphonies. <coughs> the fifth um, he recorded twice. The first one was never released. But I think the most magical performance of all is the Romeo and Juliet Fantasy Overture. Now, Years ago, I remember reading in the gramophone a review of a recording of that work. I can't remember whose it was, but the reviewer said, you know, a couple of nights ago, we sat down, me and a friend, we sat down and, and listened to Mengelberg's recording of it uh, with the Concert Chabal Orchestra, and we were incredibly moved. Well, as you can imagine, it didn't take much of a prompt for me to go out searching for the uh, Mengelberg recording, which I eventually found, and I was totally infatuated by the way the music was phrased, the drama, the incisiveness of the dual episodes, and the magnificence of the uh, Concert Cabal Orchestra. To me, the love music has never been more passionately done. Igor Markovich gets close to it on his uh, later Philharmonia recording, but to me, this one with the Concert Cabal is uh, absolutely fabulous. So, let me just play it for a little bit for you. Thank you. 
Now, that to me is the most memorable recording of that work that I've ever heard. Toscanini was brilliant. There's a live recording from the 50s. But the phrasing of that, the way it's designed, the shape of the performance is remarkable. But he could do, as I said, some odd things. And the Fifth Symphony, for example, towards the end of the uh, uh, symphony, there's a chord which would suggest, if you don't know the symphony, that the symphony is over, uh, symphony is, is finished, uh, which did lead to what some wag uh, referred to as a, a case of premature congratulation. The audience would start applauding. So Mengelberg altered the constituent parts of the chord so that it sounded unresolved. Another thing he did was with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. There's a parallel there that didn't really occur to me until quite recently. I'm going to play you two versions of the very end of the symphony. One conducted by Furtwängler, where he goes help for leather, gets to the end and the audience isn't quite sure. It seems such a violent ending. Anyway, I'll play you that first. Now that's Fort Wrangler's way with the presto ending of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Mengelberg obviously used to think, well, will the audience really know that the symphony is over? It seems such an abrupt ending. Like, I've got an idea. I I'm going to do something that I think will make them absolutely sure. And they will never be in two minds as to whether the piece is finished. So here's how he does it. Now, they certainly come in straight away, but he's having a laugh doing that. And big ritardando at the end of the Ninth Symphony, it certainly doesn't work, or it doesn't work for me. So, anyway, I'd like to know what you think, and thanks so much for watching.